for a long time, people have thought that what is central to economic growth is getting access to the inputs that they need, getting access to capital, getting access to labor. But I think that we now have a growing, almost overwhelming amount of evidence that it's not so much the inputs, but it's how efficiently you use your inputs, what we call total factor productivity. The traditional way in which people have thought about total factor productivity is that they've interpreted this as reflecting differences in the technologies that firms use. What we've documented is that it's really not technology per se, but it's about these microeconomic details by which firms are growing, some firms are dying, some people are finding jobs, some firms are expanding, other firms are contracting. And then the question is how exactly does that take place? And why is it that this process takes place in some countries and it doesn't take place in other countries? If you were to look at the census of industrial firms, say in India, and you were to randomly pick two firms and measure what is the return to capital, what is the return to labor, the difference in the return to capital and the return to labor is roughly a factor of four. You do the same exercise for two randomly picked firms in the US, what you'll find is that there are gonna be some gaps that, uh, in the return to capital and the return to labor, but the gaps are typically much smaller. That fact suggests that US labor markets and US capital markets and US laws are, are facilitating the flow of resources from firms that are not using resources efficiently to firms that are using these, re these resources efficiently. The fact that you, that you do see these large gaps in other countries suggests that these, that these markets are not operating in the same way. I'll give you one example of what could be behind this. One of the laws that's been on the books in India for a very long time is a law that was passed in 1947 called the Industrial Disputes Act. And what the law stipulates is that if you are a company that hires more than 100 workers, once you bring a worker into the company, you can never lay them off. And the rationale is that, well, the larger companies, they make a lot of money so they can better afford to do this. What are the consequences of this? The consequences are going to be, well, if you are a firm with, that is larger than 100, you get an order from Walmart. Uh, which requires you to double the size of your workforce, you think, well, if I double my workforce and the order goes away in three years, then I'm going to be stuck with the huge wage bill that I cannot afford. So rationally, what I do in response to that, I don't double my employment. Instead, what I do is I may increase it by just a little bit, so I get a little bit of the additional orders, but I don't leave myself too exposed to the possibility that, that, that the order is not going to be renewed in a few years. The consequence of this is the return to labor of the large Indian firms is incredibly high relative to the return to labor of the smaller firms. When things do change, what I've observed is that it never takes place through adoption of what I'm going to call the easy policy recommendations. The labor laws are still on the books. Nothing has changed in terms of the implementation of the Indian labor laws. Yet there's an enormous amount of evidence that in the last 15 years, what we've seen is that the bite of the Indian labor laws have changed. There's been the emergence of a new industry in India Think of it as the contract labor industry. One of the biggest companies that's in this market is a company called Team Lease. They send teams of about 50 to 100 workers to their clients, which are these large companies. What they offer to them is that whenever you don't need these workers anymore, you can just return them to us. Team Lease is a large company. It's one of the largest companies in India. It has you know, more than 100,000 workers. Team Lease has to abide by the Industrial Disputes Act, so they cannot get rid of any of their workers. But what they have the ability of doing is that they allow their clients to lay off the workers, and they take the workers, and because they're large enough, they can reallocate them to somebody else. When you look at the large Indian firms, what you see is that the gaps in the return to labor between the large Indian firms and the small Indian firms have fallen significantly. 
There's a colloquial Hindi term that they use. The word is jugad. Indian business use this term all the time. And what it in means is basically finding informal solutions to problems. The government is as surprised as all of us. Nothing changed in terms of the government. It was just some private entrepreneurs recognized that there was a problem, understood and figured out a technology that basically uh, provided this work around the regulation. The policy recommendations are about liberalizing your labor market, liberalizing your capital markets. And if you can do that, great. But what I've seen is that doing this is actually really hard politically. And what turns out to be successful is not about tackling the problem directly, but finding an informal workaround to these constraints. <laughs>